Greetings, salutations, everyone, and welcome to Deliver It. This is an Agile Product Owners Podcast. This is Corey Bryan, and over there, I see one Kim Andrakitis. Just one. Single. I only brought one with me today. That's good. <laughs> hey, happy Easter. Thank you very much. We have the bunny. We do. We just have one of the bunnies. Yes. We have the pink bunny. But we did have the Easter this weekend. So. Did you guys dye Easter eggs? The kids are kind of the old, Easter right? They're not the really candy doing that. And all that stuff. Give them so. baskets and everything? Um, actually, this is the year we stopped with the egg hunts. We just did cash in an envelope. Nice. <laughs> because that's Why don't all you invite after. me over for that? <laughs> Easter dinner and cash in an envelope. Yes. <laughs> Ham and cash. <laughs> Sweet. Mm. <laughs> when does that get old? Never. Never. No. Fabulous. I got some of that myself. Good. Ham, ham, and, ham and cash. Ham and cash. <laughs> ham and eggs, ham and cash. Nice. What's going on? Not a lot. I think I say that every time. I know. Really not a lot. Why not? I don't. You know what, you know what our Easter gift was? What's that? Um, our washer broke. Oh, boy. Yay. Right oh, before it joy. hit the spin cycle. <laughs> Yay! So yesterday morning, we had the ability, we had to basically wring out all the clothes, pull mm-hmm. out each, every one of them, wring them out, put them in the bathtub, and then take buckets and get Lovely. the water out, actually with a cup. Lovely. You know? Yeah. That was our fun. And then we got to spend the morning over at Lowe's looking for a new washer and dryer combination. <laughs> Happy Easter to us. Very fun. Yes. I have been getting our students' applications that I work with up and running in the location here. So we've actually got the code up. We've got it running. I'm entering data. I'm getting it ready to do some training sessions on it. And it's fun. That's exciting. It really is fun. And I'm using it. And somebody asked me where a room was today. And I pulled it up and said, here you go. And they walked away and I said, but wait, isn't this cool? <laughs> Let <laughs> me show you more. You, you, you missed the point. <laughs> this is cool. You have to look at this. <laughs> um, but and that's been fun. And we have... Um, I got that one up and almost ready to go. And then the other one that the students are working on, it's coming together. They're coming back for a second visit. So looking forward to that. And, um, yeah, so I they like, had two projects? Well, this or is two, two different teams? semesters. Uh, two different semesters. Okay. Yeah. But they're coming together. So Very exciting. Yay. I know you're very excited about that. I like that. I know. That's awesome. So let's see. Anything interesting happening this week uh, news-wise? Did you read anything? I did read something. What did you read? Actually, I reread. Oh, yeah? Yes. I reread The Five Dysfunctions of a Team Book. You read that one, haven't you? That's the Lincoln book, right? Patrick Lencioni. Lencioni, I'd yes. like to think he's Italian. That's Lencioni. All right. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. So um, in case our listeners haven't read this one, this is actually a very cool read. It's very easy to read, which I like. Quick, quick and easy to read. <laughs> um, basically, Patrick identifies five major problems that hinder a team's success. Do you want to know what those are? I, well, let me see if I remember. Okay. Uh, trust. Absence of trust. Absence of trust. This is embarrassing. C- uh, communication or, or, or conflict. <laughs> yeah, conflict. Fear of conflict. Fear of I conflict. punched the air, by the way, just yes. to give him a hint. You Fear of conflict. I was, I was worried for my safety. <laughs> I didn't know what you were doing. Go ahead and read the rest of them. Okay. So the third one is avoidance of accountability. Okay. And... Actually, lack of commitment was the third one. Avoidance of accountability is number four. Okay. Number five is inattention to results. Inattention to results. That's correct. Okay. So what I like about it is that his ideas are very effective um, and relatable due to how it's written. He writes it in a manner like he's telling a story. Mm -hmm. So it's not like your basic kind of typical monotonous self-help drabble. It's more interesting because you really feel like you're reading a book, a novel. It it has that little story at the the back of it, not Mm -hmm. a little story, but it's more of a taking it through an executive workshop and how they were going through the five. Exactly. And then, you know, they assign different roles to different people. And yeah, it's actually really interesting. So I reread that, not because I needed to, just because I wanted a refresher. It is a good book. And it's a quick read too. It took me, what, an hour? Yeah, it's only like 100, 200 pages, Mm -hmm. something like that. Very quick. That's very good. Guess what I did? I I could guess, but I'm not going to. I learned how to make toast. How have you made it this long in your life without knowing how to make toast? Well, I've been married for 20 now. Um, oh, not I, cool. <laughs> that's not cool. Not cool. So Dislike. There is a great TED Talk by uh, Tom Wujek called a simple system thinking exercise. Uh, he goes through and explains system thinking, a very basic um, example of system thinking by showing how people make toast. System thinking is a very broad subject. 
The focus there is to understand the whole system of which the solution and the customer are a part of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the exercises he shows, and he's got a workshop that allows others to do this. But basically what you're doing is you're looking at a complex problem. It doesn't have to be a complex problem. Making toast, not a complex problem. I can do it. I've done it. It's because you just learned. I just learned. (laughs) Um, But you take and break the steps down into components. You break those components into uh, areas that link to each other, so nodes and links, basically. You can do it multiple ways. You can draw it on a sheet of paper. He has one example. You put it on – you can do it with note cards or sticky notes and show how you link together, move them around, kind of collaborate with them. I've done several similar things with notepads themselves, using them as objects or reports or data elements and shown how they move on a table um, with the team. That's very fun. I've done it with my pens that I have. I've used my pens as elements on a report and swapped those things out. But basically, it's it's a way to physically manifest a system, and you can see how parts work together. Um, I've done it on boards when we draw boxes, you know, simple architecture stuff. But the links and the nodes and the discussion around it um, and the ability to move it around uh, is really what the, the key is there. And I really like that. It's very interactive. It is very interactive. I've I've wanted to, for some time, take my uh, kids' Legos mm-hmm. and figure out how to make little elements and bring them into work. So when I'm talking about something, data elements or reports or something else, I can have a little Lego model and move them around instead of just drawing pictures. I'm going to have a physical representation of that, which I still think is a cool idea. I just got to sit down and sort through all the Legos and <laughs> that's a lot of Legos. <laughs> And would your child be okay with you taking his Legos? Oh, yeah. They're done with Legos. Oh. <laughs> but, um, but system thinking is a very fun um, exercise. I like doing it. Um, there's a great book um, from 1975. was when the book was originally written. But it's still valid because it's about how to think, about thinking in a systematic or systems way. It's called An Introduction to General Systems Thinking by Gerald Weinberg. Um, oh. They've had an updated version in the recent past the century, basically. <laughs> uh, and that's the one I read. I never read the original one, but I read the updated version. I mean, it's very good. So I recommend that um, the Toast TED Talk, mm-hmm. which is very good. And then if you're interested in that, uh, exploring more, you can read that um, general system thinking book. And the Toast TED Talk, he also has his own website, right? Mm-hmm. And he's got exercise in case you want mm-hmm. to do the same um, analysis with your own team. So he takes yeah. you through the steps on how to build make toast it is very with your fun. own team. That's very cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I, uh, so I talked about my talk that I'm doing at Edgewell RTP Tuesday night, yes. tomorrow night, which I'm still doing. Um, I'm also doing, there's a group called Product Camp RTP, uh, which is over in Durham. They're having their seventh annual conference over at the Cree building on Saturday the 11th. And I'm going to present my same topic there, measuring success as a product owner. Um, So I'll be doing that two times this week, which is interesting. And hopefully that will, um, I know we'll talk about that later, but if you're in the area and you want to see it, please come out, say hi, uh, and we'll do that. More information about that is at productcamprtp.org. And while I'm talking about product groups, so there's a lot of things that we do that are technical in nature, process in nature, agile in nature. Product Camp is a product group. They talk about products, and that's great because it's not – you don't get into process. You don't get into that type of stuff. It's just what can your products do and how do you design them and how do you do other things. There's two other groups that I want to mention that I've started to get more information about. One of them is called Mind the Product. They're based in London, but they have 25 cities globally that are working on something called a product tank which is basically product focus. So again, if you're a product person or a product manager or a product owner and you're interested in learning more about products themselves, then that's a great um, example. They have conferences, they have videos, they have presentations, lots of good information. So mindtheproduct.com and producttank.com. And to our listeners, the word of the day is product. And every time you hear the word, you must drink. So you got to be slam drunk right now. After listening to all the product information, I don't think? know, but I'm going to go back and count. I would say at least 32 times. Maybe it's a bit extreme. That's fair. <laughs> That's you're, fair. So you're very busy. It's all I, about you this week. No, 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 no. Oh, yes, it is. No, no. 
Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> but I'll tell you what it is about. We're going to talk about our topic right now. I love this topic. Do you? Oh, my God. I get so excited by this topic. <laughs> okay. I do. Then I'll sit over here. Oh, okay. So our, our to- I'm not punching the air right now, so that's okay, good. Okay, good. Our topic of the day is da, 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 story grooming. Yay. Story grooming. Now, let's be careful. Because we've, I, I've, I've hit this before with with the word grooming. Oh boy, it is a loaded term in certain countries. So one of the things when we first started talking about story grooming, we kind of got some blank, uh, blank stares on the phone, <laughs> which is possible. Being quite positive, you can hear them <laughs> staring at the phone, going, "What did he and just say?" Judging silently. Apparently, the groom, uh, the term grooming. Uh, over across the pond uh, means something uh, negative. Mm-hmm. has a very negative connotation. Um, and that's not what we want at all. No. We want positive things and positive thinking when it comes to dealing with stories and how to make them better, how to introduce them to the team. So if your uh, organization customers or people that you're dealing with Freak out about the word grooming. Call it something else. Call it discovery. Call it story time. Call it whatever you want. But it's basically the process of going through the stories and developing them. I love story grooming. Yes. So one of the things um, that I keep in the front of my mind when I'm going through a story grooming session is that There's a quote by Mike Cohen that I really like. The features only need to be sufficiently understood so the team has a reasonably strong chance of completing it during the sprint. So, again, we're not looking for 100%. Kim, you agree? I disagree with Mike Cohen. 100%? Not 100%. Okay, good. It, it's, it, that's fine. It's, it's close. It's not zero. It's not 90, right? There's, yeah. okay. But that's the point is the grooming session is that we're going to go through and we're going to look at these stories. We're going to talk about them so that we understand them for the sprint planning session, right? Yes. Now it's supposedly a new thing. It's not in the, the, the original definition of scrum or the original definition of the things that you need to have. So it's relatively newer. By new. What do you mean by new? The past Within 10 the years? last five okay. years or so. Mm-hmm. There's lots of people that don't think you need it. That's absurd. That's but absolutely wrong. I think you and I would agree that as a product owner, do the story grooming sessions. <laughs> <laughs> don't skip them. Don't shortcut them. But we say yes. We do say yes to yeah. story grooming. <laughs> say yes to story grooming. <laughs> yeah. I, I love our story grooming sessions because it's a chance to preview the upcoming stories with the team. And it gives the team a chance to provide feedback they can ask questions. We can gauge, you know, how big or small the story is. And it just, in general, allows us to determine where improvements, um, you know, identify improvements to the backlog and to, to make it better. And that's what we're always trying to do, right, is make things better. Constantly. Constantly. So I can't imagine not having backlog grooming sessions. Yeah. No, I agree. We uh, agree. That kind of makes me sick. <laughs> it's okay. People can have different opinions. No, not when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the big thing is how often do we do it? So is this something that we do before the sprint planning? Is it something we do every day? How often do we do this? A lot of, uh, experts recommend that we spend between five and 10% of the sprints. So whatever your sprint iteration is, you spend between five and 10%. Typically what this looks like when I've done it is for a two week sprint, we'll do one to two grooming sessions during that sprint for upcoming work. Yep. We usually do two as well. And we have a two week sprint. We have two grooming sessions. Sometimes it's more, um, depending on what the backlog looks like. And sometimes it's Mm -hmm. less. Yeah. It really depends on how ready you are for the next sprints. Um, they're typically, the meetings are typically about an hour, but you can go less. And if you've got enough groomed for the next sprint and the next release, then you probably don't need to do it. And it's okay to cancel it. It's okay. I think having them regularly scheduled. Um, to make it a part of the ceremony, uh, the regular meetings that Scrum or Agile processes have is a good thing. Make it so it doesn't interrupt the team, but make it so that they understand that it's important. It's a commitment. I believe that story grooming is a commitment. You're committing to that within mm-hmm. the sprint for the team and they're committing to it as well. Right. So it's important that you make the time and, and you dedicate 
whatever effort is necessary in order to meet your commitments. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So what's the goal of story grooming? Um, I've asked myself that. What, what is my goal here? And typically for me, it's just making sure the team understands what the work entails and what done looks like. So it's useful to communicate the expectation in the meeting at the start of the time. So everybody's prepared. So typically I'll start with, okay, guys, I want to get through these five stories. I want to make sure we understand them, understand the acceptance criteria, uh, make changes if needed, et cetera. So for me, it's just making sure that everybody understands what was involved in the story and um, what does done look like. And, you know, if we can get points to it, which I know we'll talk about a little bit later. Yeah. I mean, the, the idea that, and we've said this before, but I like the idea of showing the team a story three times before they actually pick it up and put it into sprint planning. Mm -hmm. So the grooming sessions is would constitute the first two times that the team sees it. So they could see it the first time where it's just an idea or if here's a story I'm working on for next grooming session and you just throw it out there, you get them to toss around some ideas and then you come back to it next time. The second time is where you go into more details about here's the story, here's the acceptance criteria, here's what they're asking for, here's the problem that we're trying to solve and get them to give you the feedback on it um, that you need. But basically that's correct. We're asking them to look at the story before they actually work on it. Yep. And then when we talk about whether we should put a timer, I, t I don't have an actual timer that I use. I look at my computer and I, in my mind, I think, all right, we're going to talk about this thing for 15 minutes and that's it. So if the story or the discussion takes longer than 15 minutes, then I, I know that it's time for me to, to raise the point of, Hey, does this require a research spike? Because clearly we're not at the point where we can actually put points to the story. It really depends for me on how the discussion is going. If they're talking about the story itself, then I'm more inclined to let it go. Um, if they're talking about technical details, I'm more inclined to go, okay, let's stop and let's get back to either the story itself or what do you need to know technically before we do this again? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it really depends on where the discussion is going. Agreed. I agree with that. I, I mean, I know a PO who does, she has a four minute time box. So she, that seems tight. It does seem a little cheap. Four minutes to discuss the story and then two minutes to estimate six minutes she's done. So she tries to get through 10 stories per hour. Wow. Which is pretty impressive. Does she do it? I think she does. Okay. What? Which is, which is great. Maybe it works for her. I think it does. I think that's awesome. Um, I personally would like to spend a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, I'm going to say, I'm going to go back to this. I think it depends on the maturity of your team and it depends on kind of where they're at and what you're, what you're working on. If we've got a lot of really complex stories, there's no way we're going to get through them in four minutes. Yeah. But if I've got something to add a simple component to a page, sure, it's possible. So I think it, the answer is always it depends. And it, yeah, and it really depends as well on, um, if it's something they've seen before, mm -hmm. or if you're asking them to do something they've done similar to what they've done before, then it should be a quicker discussion than something brand new or a new area or something like that. Exactly. And I think as product owners during the story grooming session, it's, it's important that we remain focused on the stories because what tends to happen is scope creep happens and the team starts adding on to the complexity of the story. And it's, it's important for us to reel them back sometimes yes. and say, no, 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 we're not doing that. That's a great idea but we're not doing that. That's a separate story. It's a separate story or something that's later down the line or we need to be flexible or whatever. So I think it's important that we kind of keep our eyes on, on the goal as well. Yeah. Also, one of the things we're trying to get out of this session is some type of estimate. Now, estimation is a large topic. It will go for, we will talk about it separately as a show simply because it is so big and there are so many different ways to do it. But to say that one of the goals in your grooming session is to get an estimate on the stories that you're presenting because you want to know how big or how complex they are. So there are lots of different ways to do that. We'll hit some high points um, now, but we will definitely come back to estimation as its own um, episode later. So points, sure. If you yes. can do points, do points. Mm -hmm. Whether they're story points, complexity points, effort points, whatever kind of point you're dealing with, if the team is good at it, and if you can get it, then get a point. And to be more specific, Fibonacci sequence points. Yes, the story point. <laughs> so four is not an acceptable point. There is no four. Exactly. 
<laughs> there is no there is no spoon. There's no seven. There is no four. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Story points are good. I really like um, one of the things that you did um, when we were working together is you had a scale that you came up with and started to use. And I really like that. You want to explain that My a little bit? My sliding scale. Yes. Yeah. I think what we did was we, the team met for about an hour, hour and a half, and they reviewed some stories that they had previously worked on. Now we already had the estimates that they originally estimated at, but they went back and after reviewing the stories and the complexity and the development, the rest, we went and said, all right, well, we originally gauged this as an eight, but it was actually more of a five, for example. So what we did was we took a, I took PowerPoint, just very simple PowerPoint. I created a scale. Um, we got maybe, I don't know, 20 stories or so on the scale from the half point all the way up to, I think we stopped at eight point because I never like to go above eight. And that way we use that document for future sessions. So if the team was arguing over whether something was a three or a five, we'd pull out the benchmark document and say, okay, is it closer to these types of stories that we identified as threes or is it more closer to these fives? And it allowed us to really hone in on a more accurate point estimate. Yeah. The thing I really like about that is it gets away from the discussion around points and it goes to the discussion around how does this compare to other things? So there's several ways you could do it with triangulation or anything else, but the way you did it was you had a PowerPoint and you had it with a, you know, the line a and line. You had the stories on the line. And it was very easy for the team to go, yeah, it's more complex than that, but less complex than that. Put it there. Great. And you're done. Yep. And I really only broke it out when it was necessary. It's not like I took it out the entire time and said, Oh, let's reference this every single story. But you know, again, if it was, more of a question of is this leaning towards a five or an eight, then we would reference the document. Yeah. And if you don't have that, you should at least have a reference story that your team uses to say, this is a three or this is a large or this is a bus. Whatever sizing mechanism you use, you have something that everybody agrees that this is that and you can at least pivot off of that. Is it bigger or smaller than this? And that should be somewhere in the middle of your scale that you're using. That's true because when I came on board, there were three stories that they would use. Right. And I believe it was, you know, like a one, a five and an eight or something like that. Mm -hmm. yep. Those are good. Those are good. Yep. And not just, you know, it doesn't have to be points either. Like I always said, I don't, I don't care if we're talking elephants, you know, tigers and kittens, Yeah. whatever it ends up being. I just want to get an idea as to how big the story is. Yeah. Okay. And then, so one of the things for the meeting is, I like the scrum master to schedule it, but I do like the product owner to, to lead it. I agree. I think the product owner should lead the meeting. Yeah. It's, it's your meeting. It's, my meeting. it's your discussion that you're trying to um, have with the team about the stories. That is very true. I, I completely agree with you. I think the team should discuss it. It shouldn't just be the product owner just rambling on forever for an hour, but it definitely needs um, discussion with, with the team. Yep. And if you don't have a scrum master, and the PO schedules it. Yes, because it is again your meeting. It's <laughs> it's your chance to review that stuff with the um, the stories with the team. So, how do we know at the end of the session whether it was successful or not? I, I think that's kind of up to opinion, right? For me, it's successful when my stories are understood and I have assigned points. That's when I know it was successful. I would agree with that. I think uh, secondary. So let's say you didn't get an estimate or you didn't get – it was the first introduction or something else. I think a good secondary measure of success for that is does everybody understand what you're asking for? Do they understand in terms of the problem that they're trying to solve or on the basics of the functionality that you want? Um, and they're discussing it as they go and they come back to you. There's nothing to say that during the grooming sessions they come back – they can't come back to you and ask questions about it. You'd actually prefer that. I, would, I know I would um, because that means they're thinking about it. They're processing the information that you've given them. They're actually thinking about what they're going to do next time. And when you show it to them again, again, that's why you do it one, two, three times, um, in between either the first or the second time, they've got an answer or they've got a new question, which is even better, um, that you can answer and say, yes, that's good. That to me means if I didn't get an estimate and I didn't get you know, everybody saying – we got it for mm -hmm. the sprint planning. At least the understanding is there and it's been started. Um, and I like that too. You know, I start off this, this podcast saying that I love grooming sessions. Yes. And you know why? Because people are engaged. 
Mm-hmm. Hopefully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. I did a grooming session today and I had two developers kind of break off and have conversations about how they were going to do something. And then I had the QA person turn to me and ask me questions about how she was going to test it. And everybody was talking and engaged and, and collaborating. And that's right. what I love about it. Yeah. No, it is, it is, it is a good discussion. Um, that's ultimately what we want a lot of is discussions and collaboration. And this is a good way to get it. So speaking of discussions. Yeah. We don't want it to turn into a planning session. No. So we want to keep the focus on the story, on the acceptance criteria, on what we're trying to accomplish or what feature we're trying to build or what, again, what problem we're trying to solve. There are time for planning sessions. There are times for technical discussions. Really, that's a sprint planning session um, and outside meetings. But this meeting should not be a technical meeting. It should be a very focused uh, story meeting. So we focus on the stories. We focus on acceptance criteria. The teams will get into, I've not yet worked with the team that didn't get into some technical discussion because they want to know how we're going to implement. It's going to be this technology or this tool or something they've done before or something they haven't done. They will have those discussions. I'm fine with letting them explore that a little bit just because it helps with the understanding, but I don't want it to go too far. So at a certain point, you got to reel them back in and go, okay, let's focus on the story and this. And they're going to argue with you sometimes mm-hmm. because that's the nature that they can't give you an estimate until they talk about how they're going to implement it. Yes. Which is a very common thing. Yes. And again, you got to give, you can give them a little, a little leash or a little runway to yeah. go there. And then you try to pull them back. And say, okay. Now we're going to talk about this. This is when it's key to turn your listening ears on Yes, because I know I'm guilty of completely zoning out when they start rambling about technical stuff. I'm like, and I zone out and then I let them go on for too long. But what I need to do is really listen and know when to interrupt and say, okay, we're really going down a different path. We need to bring it back. So it's important as a PO to, to pay attention and not tune out when it gets too technical. Yeah, and I think you know it's getting into that when uh, when you start to zone out. When you start to go, I don't understand what they're talking about anymore. <laughs> the eyes glaze over. For me, I don't. I, I'm not going to sit there and code with these guys because that's not my background. That's not something I'm. I, I know or I'm interested in. But I know when they start getting it. When they start getting the method calls and classes and start talking about table structures and all those other types of things. Then I think they've gone too far mm-hmm. for th- what we're talking about. Like, you stop okay, them. You've gone too far. Where are we going with this? What are we trying to, what are you trying to, and I think it's a good question to ask is what are you trying to determine? Yes. In these questions that you're asking each other, what are you trying to determine? Is it how to do it or do you use this for it or, you know, where are you going with this? Because they should have a design meeting to talk about how they're going to implement it once they start on the story. Um, but that's not in the grooming session. No. <laughs> no. Can grooming be fun? I think grooming can be fun. If not fun, it can be enjoyable. Yes. Because I don't think that grooming needs to be this awful meeting that people trudge into and they're just sad and their arms are crossed and it doesn't have to be that way. No. I always try to have some fun with it I'm and I get – The most, I mean, this, the demo is the time where it's kind of, we're in front of the customers. The planning is very technical. The grooming session is where you can have, in my opinion, the most time to do something fun with a story. I like acronyms because I just do. Yes. And I've cracked up several teams with some acronyms because they were just funny. Um, They weren't intentionally funny. (laughs) Some of them. (laughs) But they still were funny and the Mm -hmm. team liked them. So (laughs) that's a way you can do it. Um, You can show them uh, images of what the customers are doing. I've I've done that before where we showed how a customer was doing this now or what they were using now. And you scare them with an Excel spreadsheet or you scare them with some poorly designed report or something else. That can be fun because you get to make fun of other people's things. And that's <laughs> never not fun uh, <laughs> because you're trying to see this is what they're using now. Isn't this horrible? Right. Let's find a way to do it better. Make it better. And let's make fun of this and let's get to the good thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like doing those two things at least. 
I like to definitely keep it lighthearted. I joke around a lot with the team. I dim the lights. I sometimes put on music. Have snacks. I was going to say, I, I should bring in some cookies. Yes. Everybody likes cookies. Everybody likes cookies. So, yeah, I, I definitely think it could be fun. It doesn't have to be a horrible experience. No, this is this is probably the loudest. No, it's not the loudest meeting. The sprint planning meetings are That's always the loudest loud. for me. Mm-hmm. But this is always the one that I get people coming by and looking and going, what are they talking about in there? Right. Because everybody's kind of laughing and talking. And mm-hmm. I like that. I do too. Okay. The other thing we're looking to get out of this is some feedback. So if the team is looking at the story and they have some issues or concerns, if they need to do a research spike, they should start talking about that in the scrimming session um, when you're reviewing the story. If they don't know how to use a certain technology they're going to use to implement this, then we need a spike. And what does that spike look like? Let's write that up. Let's get the acceptance criteria and let's figure out how to do that. Estimation, again, we're trying to get estimation out of here, but we don't want it to be too big. If it's too big, we'll have to come back and do something else. We'll have to break the story down into smaller elements. And then, again, we're looking for that understanding for the team that they they get what we're asking for. Right. And, you know, preparation is really key. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of preparation, I think, that needs to go in before you even step foot into your story grooming session. So obviously writing stories. The stories need to be written, clearly. Mm-hmm. Reading through the source materials, reviewing everything with – the business or tech leads to make sure you're on track. And your source materials, you're talking about requirements, documents, market information. Anything you can get your hands on. Any, any kind of documentation that the customer clients or a team have provided um, about the stories. That's how you're going through and writing those. Yep. Um, I, have, I, I send my stories ahead of time. So they usually get the stories a day or two before the grooming session for them to review. Right. And then as soon as we get in, I sit down and I say, who, who reviewed the stories? And then there's always one person says, I did. And then the person, I meant to. (laughs) I meant to. I meant to. I said, oh, you had good intentions. I had good intentions. (laughs) Thank you for your good intentions. Appreciate (laughs) that. Um, So we always talk about what stage the story should be in. I know that, Corey, you don't think it needs to be 100%. Right. Um, I think it needs to be pretty well defined. So personally, you know, I make sure my acceptance criteria is defined. I've got the wireframes in there, workflows are documented, anything else to support the goal of the story, I make sure is there so that there's nothing that's missing. Mm -hmm. Although you would disagree. No, I think it's, it's interesting to, so when I review these stories with our customers or our business people or our technical leads, BAs, anybody else. So we'll get to who attends these meetings. But I think if you're working in an environment where you can review these with some folks up front, then that's a good idea to get you kind of some early feedback um, before you go to the teams. Just, I know when we work together, we were reviewing each other's stories. So if you're working with other product owners, definitely review the stories with the other product owners. And you'd be surprised at how often people are excited to read the stories that they don't, you know, these people don't normally see stories. Mm -hmm. So it's like, Oh, you know, their ideas are on paper now. And, and I think that kind of excites them. Like, Oh, I thought about this and here it's, and they're going to talk about it. And it's kind of like an ego boost. And it's usually pretty quick too. Yeah. Yeah. If we're, if we're doing these things right, if we're in the right environment and we're doing it right, then, you know, usually new ideas get turned into stories very quickly and then spun back to them for review and then reviewed by the team. And that's the way it should work. I agree. Yeah. And then we talked about the number of stories to get through. I I usually set a goal between four and six, and then I typically have some extras if we get through them quick enough, then I've got some more. I don't like to leave a story grooming session early without having s- stories to groom. So it's almost as if I've got my core set, but then I also have others that I can pull in sure. if, we, if we finish up yeah, I agree earlier than expected. I like that idea. Mm-hmm. So the session itself, um, how to run the meetings again, we, we set it up. We're going to, I'm, I'm a very visual person. So I'm going to put something on a screen and have everybody look at it. Um, I'm very open to whiteboarding sessions and having people come up and discuss things. If I've got any kind of wireframes or box, box architecture diagrams, I'll show those anything that I can show. You know, phone calls, WebEx, whatever else I need to do. I'll definitely do those. Um, there was an interesting thread on one of the LinkedIn groups about who attends a story grooming session. My opinion is that whoever's going to implement that story is who should be in there. So basically your team, all of your team. Um, if you have two teams, then the team that's going to pick up that story is probably the one you want in there. But I definitely think it should be everybody who's going to be involved with that because everybody should have insight and an opinion 
and be able to provide feedback on that story. It shouldn't just be tech leads or one developer and you've got five other people out there that don't know what's coming down the road. Mm -hmm. That's bad in my opinion. So I would say everybody needs to be there. That's going to be on the team. I've yet to have customers involved in story grooming sessions. I've usually done their understanding of the story separately, but a lot of people say you can do that. And depending on your level of maturity with your teams and your products, then you definitely could have everybody involved with the story review it at the same time. I agree. I definitely think the team, the developers, your testers, yourself, if you have a scrum master, that person, uh, we also include our architect. Mm -hmm. So he comes as well. And then every once in a while, I may pull in um, a UX person if we've got some questions about um, designability issues. But more often than not, it's just the core team. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I do too. It works. All right. And then what do you do after the meeting? So following the meeting, I typically update my backlog. I prioritize the story. I split them up if they need to be split. So if we determine a large story need to be split into two, I go ahead and I do that. I also write any spikes if necessary. And then of course I'll, I'll continually groom it, right? I'll modify the acceptance criteria. I'll update mock-ups if we discuss the updates of the mock-ups and then I'll follow up with stakeholders if there are any kind of outstanding questions. So it's a little bit of work that needs to happen afterwards. A little homework. Yeah. A little bit of homework. A little bit of homework. Absolutely. Um, okay. So some tips and tricks. For your story grooming sessions. Tips and tricks. Uh, I like these three from Mike Cohen and they are very, they are very simple. I like simple, simple ones the day for me. Most of the time, keep it as short as possible. The stories and the grooming session. Okay. Keep it as short as possible. Don't have them just to have them, have them when they're necessary. If you don't have anything to groom, don't groom anything. If you only have two stories, get in there, groom two stories and get out. Just keep it short as possible. Show up prepared. Yes. I agree with Mike. This is. Probably the product owner's biggest sessions with the team, the biggest influence on the team is these story grooming sessions. This is the most time you're going to spend with the team looking at stories because in, in the planning, they're figuring out how to do it during standups. They're talking about how they're progressing. They'll ask you questions, but this story grooming session is the time where they're actually there. You're they're there for you and you need to respect their time and be ready for them. Um, and then encourage everyone to participate. So when you've got the team there and they're discussing a story, make sure everybody understands it. Make sure everybody's asked a question. Make sure there's not somebody off in the back of the room doing something else. Or if there's a really quiet person on your team or somebody's really shy, ask them a question about the story. Get them involved. Make sure that everybody contributes to the grooming session. Um, you know, we, you can also implement a policy of no laptops. Mm-hmm. No phones. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can bring your phone, just set it down. Don't touch it because you know, the distractions, people won't participate when they're distracted with something else. So that's right. a policy you could implement. You can do whatever you want. You're the PO right. and it's your meeting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the other things I like to do is when the team is filing into the room, I like to have my roadmap already displayed mm-hmm. so they can see where things are at. If they, anything changed, we can talk about the roadmap. We can talk about how these stories fit into the roadmap so they understand that. Um, that's always good. And then again, you can show um, the release backlog or the upcoming backlogs for the next sprint. So these are the stories we're grooming. They're going to fit in this sprint, which is in one or two more sprints. So they can see, oh, I'm, I know I'm working on this, this sprint, this next sprint, and this next sprint. So they can see how their work is going to contribute. That's a good idea. One thing that I am still working on is don't get defensive. Right. When they criticize or ask a question about your stories – don't take it personally. Yes. They're just asking a question and you need to respond in a <laughs> professional and helpful way. Check your ego at the door. Yes, please. I completely agree with that because there were, I remember when I first started the position I'm working now, I would get so defensive. Like my stories aren't good enough for you people kind of a thing. And then I realized they're not attacking my stories. They're just trying to get more information. They're trying to understand it. They just want, right. they want to understand it. Yes. I'm not being you know, ridiculed here. I, they just don't understand. Right. So I'm sorry, team, if I did that to you. But that's And again, that's part of the product <laughs> and your job is to make sure everybody understands the stories. And if somebody doesn't understand, you have to explain it more or better or a different way. Right. And again, the PO, uh, we don't know everything. No. And we're not God and we're not going to have every answer and we're not perfect. And all our jobs is just to make sure we can give them enough information yeah. and that they understand. 
Yep. You know, we can only do the best we can do. So. Yep. And then people that either retract from the grooming session or people who dominate the grooming session. Yes. So again, we want to make sure everybody contributes, make sure everybody understands or asks questions that one person doesn't dominate the conversation. So if it seems like somebody is dominating the conversation, kick them out of the room. If they're on the team, I would say no, (laughs) no, no. If they're on the team, put them in the corner. No. Oh, if they're on the team, <laughs> I'm waiting. No. I'm done. If they're on the team, then ask somebody a question. Directly. Directly. Ask them what they think or ask them what they – if they've done something similar or ask them if they have had questions or how would they approach this. So sometimes you got to draw them out and – That's a good way to shut somebody else down who's dominating the conversation. Um, And then I think you and your coach or scrum master or whoever should have a conversation outside the meeting with the person who's being more dominant if it's seen as something that is a problem. So if it's something that they're just asking good questions and they ask a lot of questions, then maybe you say, hey, you know what, maybe – Ask a few questions and let other people ask questions. Then. And then if they don't ask anything else, then you can come back to them. But if it's somebody who's trying to dominate the conversation, then you definitely want to try to explain to them that this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. And this is what you're doing. And this is how what you're doing is hindering this process. So they may need in, just information or they may need to say, okay, calm down. Or you just kick them out of the room <laughs> and tell them that they need you just to. Want to kick somebody out of the room? Kick them out of the room. Get out of the room. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right. So that is story grooming. I think that is story grooming. Do we miss anything? I hope not. I hope not too. I felt like we covered a lot of it. There's a lot to cover in story grooming, but yeah. you know, it's the meaning. Honestly, it's the meaning that of the uh, standard scrum ceremonies. It's the one that I know is going to require the most work from me. And I know it's the one that I have to work the most at to enjoy. But isn't it the most gratifying meeting? I don't know. Oh. I, the demos, the demos are much better for me. Oh, not me. Okay. Oh well, that's yeah. Okay. Well, we have, we have a own. conversation about demos too coming up, right? Yeah, demos. I want to talk about next week. That, oh, yay. Or you next, just, you're just next throwing show. it out there, huh? Yeah, I, well, I am. <laughs> So as always, we do want to get feedback from our listeners with any questions you may have in the PO space or problems you're facing, sharing good ideas for improvement or any issues with the show itself. And you can find us online at deliveratcast.com on Twitter at deliveratcast, and you can email us at deliveratcast at gmail.com. We do have a question of the week. From Mary. Mary's question is a good one. So, all right, I'll go ahead and read it. Mary says, are there techniques to pull end users out of their comfortable use of a badly designed app? (laughs) Too often they can't see outside that original design and want to continue doing it the way they did it in the upgrade or replacement, even if it's so bad they've been doing workarounds. So this is, this is one of those interesting things where you see users that are, it's a horrible app. It's a bad process. And you wonder how they got there, but the fact that they're able to use it, that they've learned how to deal with a bad application and God forbid you should change something because they got this working and Mm -hmm. they can make it do what they want to do. How do you get them away from that? That is a good question that goes into... A lot of uh, choice. It goes into a lot of um, cultural things. It goes into a lot of um, habit forming. Applications and products can be habit forming, both good and bad, (laughs) right? Candy Crush. Yes, Um, (laughs) Candy Crush. But there are when people get used to work using a crappy product and they figured out a way to do it. It's very hard to get them out. Now, the best way that I've seen do that is with prototypes is with some form of design that lets them see that this is better and why it's better. So the user has a goal. Okay. Their goal is not to use this crappy app and to 
find out a way to get through these 17 screens they have to go through to get the report or the export they want. That's not their goal. Their goal is to do something with that data. And that's what we're trying to shoot for when we're developing and designing a new product, uh, especially for something that is something that's old like this. So showing them a prototype, showing them a clickable wireframe. Um, I just got a opportunity to look at a new product um, that's coming out and it was clickable wireframes. <gasps> so it was just very interesting stuff, right? But it wasn't a complete product. And you have to show people that there's a benefit to that. They don't have to buy it. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. Some people will, you know, some people will use the crappy thing and they would prefer the crappy thing because they know the keystrokes and they've got all these, you know, workarounds, uh, workarounds and everything else. Right. You have to show them product. You have to show them how it can be better and you have to get them, you have to give them time. I was going to say, I think people are just naturally resistant to change. Yes. And it's up to the PO to be sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. And again, check your ego out the door. It's not about you. It's about the fact that they, they may not find their application perfect, but it works for them. And like you said, they've been able to find workarounds and they don't want to learn something new when this thing technically isn't broken. It's still doing what it needs to do. Right. So it's, it's it's a tough, it's a tough one. Yeah. The, the fun or the interesting Cases are when they're using an app that is off support or it's going off support and they can't keep using it, right? Those are the ones where you see people just lose their mind because mm-hmm. well, how am I going to get my work done? Well, you can use this new version, but I know, I know control alt plus four and enter six times gets me the thing. Why would you do that? <laughs> Cause that's, that's what they've been doing. I know. So I, again, I think the best thing to do is start to. Show them that there's a better way. Prototype that. Early delivery helps. So if you can get something to them quickly and get them acclimated to a new way to do things, I think that helps. But you got to try, and you got to keep trying. You got to be persistent about it. Um, you got to beat them over the head. A lot of times, so let's say there's a group of ten people that are using this app that are using it the old way. If you can get one person to buy in on this new way, then that person's going to talk. And they're going to start talking about, you know, if two people on that team are doing the same report, one person is going to do it in the new way. They're going to do it in five minutes. One person is going to do it the old way. They're going to take 15 minutes and they're going to start. You're going to start to turn some heads. You're going to start to turn some, some hearts, some attitudes, right? And once you start doing that, then your job is pretty much done because you're just feeding the machine. You've gotten the people who are influential enough to see that there's a better way and you get them actually doing it. And pretty soon that one person that loans stand out will be, you know, nine other people will be doing this new thing and they will be having much more success than that one other person is. Mm-hmm. So I like that too. Mm-hmm. That's not the best strategy, but it is a strategy. I think those are all very good strategies. And at the end of the day, I think it's important that you just keep reminding them of the benefits that they're getting and the value of what, what you're delivering to them. It may be different, but if you can spin it so that you can see that they'll be more efficient with the use of their time or whatever, whatever the end goals, whatever's making it better for them and just kind of keep yep. reminding them and showing them how we're trying to make a product for you that's not only useful and valuable, but that will do many more things for you than your current one does. I think it's a very good topic for a future show though. This it's a good change one. It's a great question. mindset or change management or how do you change uh entrenched attitudes or something like that. Thank so, you, Mary. That's a great question. Yes, thank you, Mary. We appreciate it. All right. Anything else? Any other last minute things Nothing before else we get out of here? Me. All right. So we will start by saying that these words are our own and are not endorsed or representative of any company or organization. You can find me at IsCoreyBryan on Twitter and infrequently blogging at don'tyellame.wordpress.com. And as always, I can be reached through the show contact information. And we just delivered episode four. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope to join you next time. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.